From Washington, Diplomacy and Global Affairs, in Conversations with Nicholas Krull. On the program today, we look at diplomacy and the military with the Superintendent of the West Point Military Academy, Lieutenant General Robert Caslin. We in the military pride ourselves in building a plan, then aggressively uh, uh, executing that plan. We know that that plan is, not, is going to change over time, but we want to have the agility to adapt to it. We're very focused, um, and, and, but that's not necessarily the way that the diplomats do it. The diplomats, and rightfully so, what I learned from them was through developing a relationship, the, uh, the, the, the same objective is accomplished, but it's not so much the United States accomplishing the objective as the diplomat learns to help and mentor the indigenous host nation counterpart to gain ownership of that idea and then through their own capacity and capabilities to accomplish the objective. Castlin on the relationship between America's soldiers and diplomats, the challenges of expeditionary diplomacy in war zones, and the lessons on training the military can teach the Foreign Service. Stay tuned. Support for Conversations with Nicholas Krolov comes from these sponsors and viewers like you. To contribute, visit nicholaskrolov.com. Thank you for joining us. Lieutenant General Robert Castlin is here. This summer, he became the 59th superintendent of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He has been an officer in the U.S. Army for nearly four decades and has fought in three wars, two in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. He has also served in a variety of domestic and foreign assignments, including in Haiti and Honduras. In the last two years, he was the highest ranking U.S. military officer in Iraq as head of the Office of Security Cooperation at the American Embassy, where I met him in 2012. And he is, in fact, one of the people in my book, America's Other Army. Welcome. Good to see you again. Thanks, Nicholas. Great to be here. Thank you very much. All right. So what is the Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq? <laughs> well, the Office of Security Cooperation is exactly what the title says, security cooperation. And principally, they are the ones that uh, work the military to military engagements. They're the ones that work security assistance. With the government of Iraq? With the government of Iraq. That's right. Okay. So security, so does that include uh, weapons sales? Yeah. That's the security assistance portion of security cooperation. So. Uh, we continued the process of, of modernizing the Iraqi army with foreign military sales, and we provided uh, a little bit of training with the, with the equipment that was provided, not with U.S. forces, but with contractors, which was in a model that Iraq really appreciated. We also worked very closely with CENTCOM to bring Iraq into some of the regional exercise programs. So if there was an exercise with another Gulf nation or if there was an exercise just with Iraq itself uh, participating in it, whether it was by on land or sea or whatever, uh, we, we were integrating Iraq into the exercise program as well. All of it was designed to um, build Iraq's capacity and its capability and to give them the capability of providing security for, for their own people. Okay, so when it comes to sales of weapons or other military equipment, your office, or you ultimately work for the Department of Defense, right? Mm -hmm. And so DOD and the State Department actually work together on these deals, right? I understand mm -hmm. that they, they, they're initiated by the Pentagon, but the State Department also has a role in vetting those deals and approving them before they go forward. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Well, that, that's correct, because according to the, uh, the law, the, the, the principal Department of the United States government that has responsible for security cooperation and security assistance ends up being the Department of State. Uh, so with the Department of State, with the departure, well, let me just say this, with the departure of U.S. forces, Department of Defense transitioned at the end of 2011 from a lead that went from defense to state. And then we in the Office of Security Cooperation fell under the authority of the Chief of Mission, who was the ambassador, Ambassador Jim Jeffries at the time. Um, and at that particular point, uh, all of our work that we were doing, all of the sales that were, um, um, that were being agreed upon uh, had to go through the vetting of the Department of State and we work with the Department of Defense and of course with the Iraqi government. A number of them also uh, Department of State had to bring to Congress. So Congress had to approve a number of them as well. All right, so when we were told that at the end of 2011, the U.S. military was leaving Iraq. Mm -hmm. In fact, to this day, there are still members of the U.S. military in Iraq in that office that you were the head of for two years. So in addition to equipment or weapon sales training, do they get involved in any other aspects of the work of the embassy? Well, this is the main, these are the main. Well, things. what you'll, you'll find a, some type of a security cooperation uh, organization in most, in most uh, embassies okay. uh, all under the Chief of Mission Authority. And their main purpose is to work with the indigenous uh, military forces of that particular nation. 
Um, when we transitioned out of Iraq, we had a, a base plan of about 157 military that was going to be reassessed each particular year. We beefed it up at the end of uh, 2011 with some extra staff personnel just to facilitate the transition. That quickly came back down to, to uh, about the 157 level where it is right now. And uh, since I left in May, I'm not sure what the future plans uh, will finally firmed up and what it's going to actually look like. So military training, yes, but police training, you didn't do that, right? Police no. training was the State Department the, the, with the, contractors. That's correct. The lead for the police training was Department of State. And Department of Defense, Department of Defense in the Office of Security Cooperation, working for the Chief of Mission, the ambassador was responsible for, for the fielding of the equipment and the training of the equipment that was fielded to the Iraqi Iraqi forces, military forces. So this was your second time in Iraq. You, in fact, commanded the 25th Infantry Division, mm -hmm. right, in 2008. Eight in 2009. Right. How was, uh, and that wasn't in Baghdad, right? No, that was up north. Right, that was in so the north. So we had all the northern So the provinces. first time up in the north and then the second time in Baghdad. How was Iraq different the second time? Uh, what we found, when I left in 2009 and came back in 2011, I came back in September 2011, about four months before U.S. withdrawal. I found uh, the Iraqi military very proud. I found them very capable. Um, I was uh, very uh, surprised and pleasantly surprised with the relationship that, are, that the Iraq military had with the Kurdish because that is always a point of some animosity um, over generations, actually. Uh, but that was working very well. I was um, very pleased to see Iraq very proud of the fact that they were a democratic nation. They were boasting of the fact that uh, they initiated the Arab Spring and all the other neighboring Arab countries, both in Northern Africa and the rest of the Middle East. And uh, most Iraqis were very proud of the fact that they were a democratic nation and they were able to d uh, resolve differences among sects and, and among ethnicities uh, through, through diplomacy and through dialogue at the table. Now that you're back, what do you say to friends, family who might ask you, you know, we spend all this money and, and human life and we still hear in the news almost every week, if not every other day, dozens of people killed at a funeral or a wedding or in a, in a mosque. <coughs> what do you say to these Americans who, who think that we've, we've actually sacrificed quite a lot in Iraq? I think, I think at the end of 2011 and even today, there is such tremendous potential in Iraq that you can take generations of differences and introduce a government, a representative government that has the capability of resolving differences. Iraq is struggling, as we know, with governance and uh, representative governance. Uh, they're struggling with, between Sunni and Shia, and they're struggling between the Kurds and the Arabs. What's complicating their progress is a lot of the spillover that's occurring from Syria. So you have a lot of the sectarian strife that's coming over from Syria, and it doesn't start, it doesn't divide itself between the Iraq-Syrian border, it divides itself between the, the Sunni and Shia provinces, which incidentally are just outside of Baghdad. So that spillover goes into Western, uh, in Anbar province of Western Iraq, and it generates a lot of uh, discontent and, and, and uh, drivers of instability. It puts additional, that, that puts additional pressure on the government, the Iraqi government, to be able to govern more effectively so that they can continue despite all the the instability to, to build representation between the Sunnis and the Shias and Kurds and the Arabs. And that's what we're finding is very difficult. But I think uh, Iraq is at the crossroads, that they can really take these generations of differences and, and be able to resolve them through a democratic process or not. And, and or these not. things often get resolved only by the change of generations, right? That may be the, and then there are several countries in the region that well, you the hope is in, is in the young generation. Well, we, we would like to see that, I'm, you know, and you, you go back to see where the major transitions uh, occurred in Europe, you know, when the, tra when, when the enlightening occurred and all that, but uh, in Iraq, th they're right at the crossroads where they can have their own at this particular point, if they want, if they want. All right, so back in 71, you began as a cadet mm -hmm. at West Point. What made you want to join the U.S. Army at well, 1971, I was a senior in high school. Um, I played football in Vermont, and I was uh, contacted by West Point about considering coming to West Point to play football. Um, I was also looked at by a Navy, and I was also interested in the Coast Guard Academy and even ROTC and some of the schools in Vermont itself. Uh, but, but Iraq, I'm, I'm sorry, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but another uh, war, <laughs> Vietnam but, war. Yeah, 
but it was a Vietnam War that was very, that weighed very uh, instrumental in, in some of my decisions. Um, since I was in high school during the Vietnam War, a lot of my instructors, my teachers, were encouraging me not to go to the West Point route. Um, and uh, for all the obvious reasons, because it was a very unpopular war at that particular point. But I saw it as an opportunity, not only because of, of being recruited to football, I just saw it that West Point had tremendous opportunity. Their graduates were very successful, not only in uniform, but even outside of uniform after they served uh, the, the military. And um, it was also an opportunity to provide leadership to soldiers and service members in our, in our military in some tough times. And I, and I really enjoyed that. I wasn't about to be the person behind a desk someplace. Did you think that you would still be serving more than 40 years later? Yeah. Was, that, was that in your plans? <laughs> no, I thought, well, you know, when you go to West Point for four years, you have a five-year obligation. Right. So I thought I was going to do my five years and then get out. And now here I am after a grad. I've, been, I've graduated now 38 years. And if you include the four years at West Point, it's 42. But now here, 38 years later, I'm still in the military serving. But I, I actually fell in love with the military. You know, I love being with soldiers. I loved uh, leading them in the toughest conditions. I loved sharing our trips with them. And, and then when you go off on these deployments, whether it's Haiti or Honduras or El Salvador or, you know, even Iraq and Afghanistan, our nation's citizens, our, our clients, put their trust in you to accomplish a very significant mission for, for our national interests. And it's very motivating. It's inspiring to be able to, to accomplish that mission. Right. Okay. So in Iraq and Afghanistan, one of the things that happened was that the military and the foreign service or the diplomats of the United States worked together in what's called the non-permissive environment, right? In, in war, war zones. And this was sort of the silver lining. And obviously there were issues and it's a war, so there's tremendous human suffering. But one of the silver linings, if one is uh, willing to see it, was the fact that the, you know, the working together um, of these two institutions actually did bring some benefits, at least better understanding of each other, right, of the other. So did your perception of diplomacy of what the Foreign Service does change either through your experience in Afghanistan or in Iraq or both? Well, one of the fundamental things we learned in these wars is that the way we used to fight wars in the Cold War where you mass combat power at a decisive point on the battlefield, either to destroy a target or seize key terrain, that was not necessarily the way we fought wars here gain effectiveness here was to be able to build a relationship, to build a, a fundamentally Iraqi's capacity both in governance, economic, and military, and security. But, but by doing that through building a relationship. So the skill sets of tactical warfighting at, that we used to have were being replaced by the skill sets of interpersonal relationships that were necessary. And talking, <laughs> rather than fighting. And, 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 the, and the environment was so complex, and the ability to understand the culture was so, so important that all of us in the military were not very adept at doing that by ourselves. The good thing that was done early on in Afghanistan and Iraq was the development of these provincial reconstruction teams, which were interagency personnel that came in that collectively worked together at the tactical level with our, our formations that were out there. And then we partnered with them. They gave us tremendous insight. They gave us, uh, they brought a, a wealth of knowledge. And then what, one of the key things they brought, particularly our Department of State brothers and sisters, is they brought the ability to, to, to build these interpersonal skills and interpersonal relationships with Iraqis that uh, the military just, uh, it took some time for them to develop the skills themselves. Right. And no. that was tremendously helpful. I, and I've got all the respect in the world for the, the tremendous patriots of our, all the different departments of the United States government, and in particular the Department of State. So in addition to what you just said, is there anything fundamental about the way diplomats do things compared to the way soldiers do things? mentality, operational readiness, how they attack a problem? Well, you know, we in the military pride ourselves in building a plan, and then aggressively uh, uh, executing that plan. We know that that plan is, not, is going to change over time, but we want to have the agility to adapt to it. We're very focused, um, and, and, but that's not necessarily the way that the diplomats do it. The diplomats, and rightfully so, what I learned from them was through developing a relationship uh, the, the, the same objective is accomplished, but it's not so much the United States accomplishing the objective as the diplomat learns to help and mentor the indigenous host nation counterpart to gain ownership of that idea, and then through their own capacity and capabilities to accomplish the objective. 
which is really, in the end, almost more effective because if they gain ownership and pride in the fact that they were able to accomplish the objective rather than some other person doing it for them, then they're going to take more ownership of it. And if they take more ownership of it, then, then it becomes more institutionalized in the end. Right. So it's, in the end, it's a very, very helpful way to be able to work with our indigenous partners. And that's why, in fact, um, the art of diplomacy is to persuade the other country or person that it is in his or their interest to do what you want them to do, right? <laughs> and ultimately, that you can judge the success yeah. by whether they were able to achieve that. And in Iraq, we had successes and failures at the same time. Yeah, there is a, there's an entire spectrum of how people react to your ability to communicate that. I mean, some people get it and they'll listen to you and they'll, they'll, they'll buy into it. Some people will be polite and listen to you and then go off and do their own thing. Right. Um, so. What did you think, and we talk generally about diplomats, you know, they're, they're different people, they're not all the same, and they have different understandings and, and knowledge about things, but, but in general, what did you think they didn't really understand about the military that they maybe learned through this experience? Um, you mean the other departments of the United States government? Yes, right. Well, I, you know, <clears throat> some people have different um, preconceived views of, you know, the military. We might be knuckle dragon gorillas running around, you know, and all we want to do is to break things. And, um, and although that, that's, a, you know, a, a common trait with a lot of us, at the same time, we have a desire to learn and to learn from our mistakes. We have a desire to change. Um, we have a desire to, uh, we, we have recognized, particularly in this war, the importance of partnering not only with the indigenous forces and indigenous government personnel, but also with our um, uh, interdepartmental government personnel, Department of State, Department of Treasury, of Department of Justice, of, right. yes, of the United States government. And we, we valued that relationship, and we understood the importance of it. And it was through that give and take and that compromise and, and frankly, just sitting there listening that we became, we, we became stronger as a result. These problems are so complex that military security solutions are not the only solution to get to solve the problem. You have to have an equally complex solution for this complex problem. And that complex solution comes about through the, different, through the support of all the agencies of our United States government. So the sooner we in the military realize that we were partners with all the different departments, other departments, the sooner we were able to come up with the solutions that were going to solve these complex problems. Did you learn much about the training that is provided to diplomats? And the things that I have no doubt that many of the people at the embassy, whom in fact, some of whom I know and I met in Baghdad, but also knew beforehand some of them, I know that many of them are very good and effective at what they do. But do you know the answer to the question, is that the result of training that was provided to them by the department, or is that something they learned on their own? Well, I'm familiar with the, with the Department of Defense's training, right. because every unit that would go deploy to Iraq would go through either Fort Polk, Louisiana, or Fort Irwin, uh, California, the NTC or the JRTC. We would always invite our provincial reconstruction teams to train with us. But I mean, if you, but you're viewing it from the defense side. You're viewing this is a defense training event that we're inviting the other departments to train to our standards, to our, our environment. But what you were missing in all of this is the Department of Defense personnel going to the Department of State's training event or the Department of Justice's training event to train to their standards and their environment. And, and although there were various organizations and commands that had individual staff persons go to the Department of State and work with them for a couple of weeks and understand where they were going and what, and what their objectives were going to be, we probably could do a better job of that, you know. Interagency. The, yeah, the interagency sort of training uh, model. That I think the Department of Defense has a good model, but it's a Department of Defense model. It's not an interagency model. It's a Department of Defense model. It's not a Department of State model. And the training that the state would do, whatever level it was, whatever complexity it was um, if, the, if the defense personnel can train with them, but not only to gain that skills, but also to gain the, to, to, start, to start developing that relationship. Because right. it's the relationship that's going to get the effectiveness. 
And the ability to understand, respect, and to listen with each other and with where your ideas are coming from and your culture and things like that. And ultimately get things done, yeah. right? That's the goal anyway. All right. Have you actually um, counted how many years in your career have been spent in training? Or approximately? Um, <laughs> or maybe a third? <coughs> well, I, if we're not fighting, we're training. Right. And, you know, it, you know we also, tra even when we're deployed, we're, we're not always out fighting all the time or doing a patrol or, or work. I mean, when you're not doing that, you're back in, in the rear training as well. Right. The, 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 the pr fundamental principle is you're going to fight as you train. So you got to build the training environment and the training uh, uh, exercise as complicated and as difficult as it's going to be when you fight. And if you can do that, uh, you'll be better off. At the same time, to get higher in the, in the military, to get promoted, that at every level you have to take certain training, right? Um, well, you, you take, you, you, the units train to their, their required tasks. The individuals, both non-commissioned officers and officers and even our soldiers, uh, we, we have training, but we, well, we call that, um, and we go to different courses, and we call that professional military education. So, so in order to increase in rank, depending on what rank you are, there's a certain school that you may have to attend. That school can be anywhere from a month to a year. And that gives you a level, uh, an education level, professional military education level, um, and, and that increases as your grade increases. For example, our former battalion commanders who are senior lieutenant colonels and junior colonels go to the War College, the National Defense University. And sometimes the Department of State comes over there and trains with them as part of that. Right. But it's a military education event more so for that individual than it is a training event. Training is more collective uh, with a unit. Right. Uh, so you sort of actually do differentiate between training and education, that's which correct. is important. That's correct. Um, and uh, by the way, I, as it probably is evident, I don't know much about the military, so some quite the questions I ask may not be as intelligent <laughs> no, as, uh, as I might <laughs> like them to be. But, but this is a good point because there is the West Point, there is the National War College, there is the Naval War College, right? There, or there's NDU, a bigger institution than just the college. And I'm sure many people who are not familiar with military training wonder why do we need all these schools. But so let's first talk about West Point. It has a particular purpose, right? It's not the National War College. What's the difference? Well, the purpose of West Point is to develop leaders of character for a lifetime of service for their nation, starting off with the Army. It's focused on, on preparing young men and women to be officers, lieutenants in the United States Army. The War College is prepared to, to make officers, mid-level officers, to prepare them to be senior level officers so they can operate effectively within, within the interagency and within joint environments. Okay. How many people approximately go to West Point right now? Well, we, right now we have 4,400 cadets. Yeah. Okay, what does the job, the, the new job now that you have since uh, July, right, mm -hmm. of, of this mm -hmm. year, um, what does it entail? What is it that you spent most of your time on? Well, as a superintendent, you're, you've got a couple jobs. Most people recognize the superintendent as the president of a university, but you're also the commander of West Point. So it's, a, it's not only a university, it's also a military installation. So you're the commander of the, ins of the installation. And you're also the, uh, um, you know, the commander of that command, but you're also the commander of the installation. So you have all the garrison responsibilities as well. But most people realize superintendent with, uh, they look at superintendent with being a president of a university or a chancellor in some cases. What kind of graduates do you want West Point to have in four years? Well, that's a great question. I mean... <laughs> For the ones who are just starting. If you look at the last 12 years in the, in the type of wars we've been in, they're about as complex and, and as ambiguous as you could imagine. I remember, you know, from my tour when I was a division commander in the north, we had a battalion commander who um, was in Samara, which is right outside where the Golden Mosque was blown up. So it was a very contentious, the security was about as, as critical as you could imagine. And so what does he do to, to try to bring security to the area? Well, he finds two wealthy Iraqis, they combine their money and he creates an Iraqi bank. So he then, then they start to loan the money out and they, in one case, they loan the money out to this dilapidated tomato factory. And they got the tomato factory up and running again. 
That in turn put a demand on all the farmers in the area, so they started farming again. There, because they wanted to farm, that put a demand on the local government to start getting the infrastructure up and running again because you had a, it's all irrigation farming, you had to get the water out of the river into the canals, you had to get the canals open again, then you had to get the water out of the canals into the fields. And then you have to get the pumps running, which means the electricity has to be running and stuff like that. Well, all of a sudden they're growing tomatoes like crazy. They're bringing them in. There's trucks all over the place and they don't have a place to park. So he builds a parking lot. And out of the parking lot, the Iraqis themselves build a restaurant because they would need something to eat. And someone ends up building a hotel. And, uh, and then all these other little companies start spinning off. You know, one to build labels and one to build the little tin cans and things like that. And then the security situation in Saladin province, at least in that area, went from one of the worst to one of the best. You got people off the streets, you got people working, you gave them some hope for the future, and the next thing you know, he's fighting war. This is how you fight wars differently. This is the type of West Point graduate we need to have today. Someone who understands this complexity and looks at that problem differently and has the, has the intellect to be able to not only understand it, to find, but, but to find solutions in it as well. I had a lieutenant, a brand new lieutenant. Matter of fact, I was a commandant of cadets in 2006 and seven, He was one of my cadets. He ended up in my division. He deployed. I went out to see him. He was in the Jazeera Desert during the sun, with the Sons of Iraq. He had a couple hundred of them, and, he had, and his job was to develop a relationship between the Sons of Iraq and the Iraqi Army, so ultimately the Iraqi Army can assume responsibility of them. Right. So I was out visiting him on the middle of the desert. His cell phone rings, and he starts speaking Arabic. And I said, Sam, I, after five minutes, he hangs up. I said, Sam, I didn't know you took Arabic at West Point. He goes, no, I didn't. I took French. And I, <laughs> and I said, well, where'd you learn Arabic? He goes, well, I picked it up on my own. So these are the type of young men and women that uh, West Point is graduating and putting into these type of very complex environments. And they, and they get it. And they, they, they don't survive in the complexity. They thrive in the complexity. So the big question for me as a superintendent is, do we have the right leader development models at West Point? Do we have the right leader development models academically? militarily, athletically, and in character so that we can produce the type of officer in our army that can thrive in these complex environments. So do you have them? It, yes, um, yes, we are assessing and reviewing them as a matter of fact, and we'll make some, some can changes. Can always do the, better, right? Oh, yeah, oh yes, always. Right. And, the, and the environment changes. And then we, and what the environment is going to look like in four years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, we have, to, we have to do our best to understand that so that we have the right leader development models for, for what that environment is going to look like in the future. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you very much for coming. Okay. Good to see you. This is your book since you're in it, but here you go, your yes, copy. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for more about our show or to make a contribution, the address is nicholaskralev.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.